Thank you because you are our defender. Thank you because you are our keeper. We exalt your holy name. We go out daily. We come in safely because your God kept us. Lord, we worship you. We give glory to your holy name. We exalt your holy name, mighty one. There is none like you and none can be compared to you. We exalt you, King of glory. We will exalt you, mighty one. Blessed be your holy name, King of glory. We worship you. We thank Thank you for all that you have to us, Lord. We worship you. Thank you for your love towards us that is on hand. In we worship you, O King of Glory. You've been a father to us, you've been our friend. Thank you, Father, for the ways in which you lead us and guide us. Thank you, Father, before the ways in which you instruct us through your word and by your word. Lord, we give glory to you. Indeed, our heart is full of gratitude. We exalt your holy name mighty one. There is none like you, King of glory. None can be compared to you. We bow before your throne in worship and adoration of your holy name. We do not take any of your goodness towards us for granted. We give all the glory to you. You are a good father. You are a merciful God. Lord, we exalt your holy name. Thank you, oh sweet Jesus. Thank you, Abba Father. We exalt your holy name. We thank you, King of glory. Blessed be your name, mighty God. We worship you. We bow before your throne. Thank you, Jesus. We exalt your holy name. Thank you for all you had to us. We exalt you. We give glory to you. We say thank you. Mighty one, there is none like you. Glorious God, we exalt you. Thank you, Father. Hallowed be your name, mighty one. One. Why glory be your name, King of Kings? We exalt your holy name. We adore you. We join the elders in saying, Glory to you, O God in the highest. Glory to you, O King of Kings. Glory to you, O hell shall die. None like you, mighty one. We give glory to you. Thank you, Yahweh. Thank you, have a Father. Glory be to you, O God in the highest. We give you hope all the glory. Thank you, mighty God. We worship your holy name. Blessed be your name, mighty one. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. We give glory to you. In Jesus' name we worship. Hallelujah. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is no My Jesus, 
Give him praise, exalt him, magnify him. Say, Father, we thank you. What a wonderful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. That's the name that is above all names. The scripture says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above all names. It says that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. Every knee must bow. Things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth. And every tongue must confess that Christ is the Lord. Go ahead and just say, Father, thank you. Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you are Lord over our lives, over this place. You are Lord. You are Lord. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight to study your word and to learn at your feet. We ask that you will speak to us. Open our eyes. Let your word be taught expressly. Speak through my vo vocal cords. Let your words go forth unhindered. In the name of Jesus. Let there be illumination. Let there be light. Let there be deliverance and healing and lifting. In Jesus' name. For in Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said. Praise God. Please be seated. Amen. It's good to see everybody. Welcome. And to our online um, family, we say it is good to see you. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. We are um, finishing the part of this series that has to deal with loving God this evening by God's grace. Amen. So we, we've been looking at um, all the, our four cornerstones. We've looked at grace, we have studied faith, we have studied righteousness, and then we are studying the last one, which is love. And we, 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 in love, we have talked about the love of God. We are, we are talking about our love for God, and the last part of the series will be um, our love for one another. So in our love for God, we... Our key scripture or passage was taken from the book of Mark, chapter 12, from verse 30, when Jesus was quoting from the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and it was asked the question, the greatest of all the commandments, of all the law. And it says, Jesus said to them, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus said, this is the first commandment. And he said, the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So in Jesus giving us the first commandment in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, we, we understand how we are to love God. All right? There are four different means, capacities, or resources given there. With all your heart, bring your heart first. Then with all your soul, and then you can bring your mind, and then your strength. So we've studied loving God with the heart, with the soul, and, the, and for two weeks we studied Loving God with our minds, if not more than two weeks. But today, by the grace of God, we will look at how to love the Lord with all our strength. So our, what we're studying tonight is love the Lord with all your strength. Can I hear an amen? Praise God. All right. I am excited to talk about this topic. Now, disclaimer. This is an advanced course. How many people are ready for an advanced course? All right. Amen. So the, the fourth um, means. Uh, that, uh, that we must use or that, that must be given to God in love. That's, that's the first the resource that we possess, that God has put in our possession, that we are custodians of, that we must use to love God is our strength. So you shall love the Lord your God first with your heart and then with your soul and with your mind. And then this capacity is using your strength. Now, it gets interesting. If you look at all these four things, the only component that is outward, that has an outward or an external connection, is strength. Right? Your heart is in your heart. Your soul, nobody can see your soul. Your mind, nobody, you, even you can't see your mind. Right? So your, your heart sometimes is a word that is interchangeably used with your spirit. You, can't, you don't see it. You don't get to see it. So but your strength is something that you can display. You cannot display your heart. You cannot display your soul. People sell their souls. Right? You cannot display, well, you can display your mind to an extent, but you need your strength to do it. So the str your strength is the only one that is easily 
can be easily displayed. And it's like that so that it can be used to show your condition for the first three capacities. So your strength is what you use to show how much you love God with your heart. Your strength is what shows us how much you love God with your soul and how much you love God with your mind. Praise God, are you with me? So others are internal. And how you love the Lord your God um, can only be displayed by your strength or your might. If you look at the next, next line, it says the Hebrew word for this word strength, that the Hebrew word in the Shema is mehot, mehot. And it is the literal translation of the word mehot is much or very, right? All the other words, if you look at them, they are nouns. So because you can possess nouns, right? You can possess. Nouns are things that you can possess, that you can have. All right, so you can love the Lord with all your heart. That's yours. That's a noun. You can love your love, love the Lord your God with all your soul, right? That's your soul, and you can love the Lord your God with all your mind. It's yours. It's a noun. Now, if you look at this word, very is not a noun. Or much is not a noun. It's it's an adjective that is used to really qualify other words to express the intensity of their meaning to augment. To, to qualify the meaning of other words. So if you look at the word very, when we say very good, that means we are saying it's not just ordinarily good, it's extraordinarily good. Are you with me? Praise God. So that's the word mehod. And if you look at the scriptures in the Old Testament, because that's that was written in Hebrew, it's, it's, you can see it almost about 300 times in the scriptures. And because it's an adverb, usually most of the time that you see this word mehod, you will see it with other words. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, and God was making things, and six times he would look at what he has made and he said, and it was good. And then in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God saw it and he said, and it was very good. And then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was mehot good. So if you look at that, that's what it says. It was mehod good. It wasn't just good. So there was an adjective that was used to qualify how good it was. It was not just regularly good. It was mehod good. It was very good. Please stay with me. And then if you look at Genesis chapter 15 verse 1. Can you give us Genesis chapter 15 verse 1? God was speaking to Abraham before he became Abraham. God was speaking to Abraham and God told him. Uh, he said, and, and after this, as the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, do not be afraid. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. He says, your mehod great reward. Are you with me? So it's, it's a word that shows, now this is not just a great reward, it's a mehod great reward. So God uses this word to the Bible uses it to qualify something and say very the extent to magnify or amplify or intensify the meaning of the word. Now, so far we're together. Praise God. Amen. So, and sometimes you will see a, a repetition of this word. Like Jacob, the Bible says he became meod, meod, prosperous. Very, very prosperous. So, then what does it mean when God now says, you must love the Lord your God with all your meot? So it means much. So the word meot actually means muchness. If we put it in a noun, your muchness with everything. Praise God. So if you look at each through the scriptures, you can, also see, see, you can also see several other ways this word is translated. It, is, it also means might. And actually, um, some translations will say, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Right? Your might. Your might is what you have to display, what you have to put to use, the, your resources at your disposal. Right? And also, it means wealth. It means power. It can also mean exceedingly or strongly. In other words, I'm trying to say this word is used to amplify something exceptionally, severely. It means muchness. So it, we are saying that we are to love God with our might or with our power. Now, if you say with our might or with our power, 
Um, this doesn't mean that you have to go to the gym for the Lord to show off your strong muscles. Praise God. Um, you don't have to go to the gym and say, I can bench 300 pounds. And say, when I'm benching it, I can say, how Lord, I love you. How much I love you. And sing, I love you, Lord, at the same time. And that makes means you love the Lord with your strength. It doesn't mean you show you off your muscles when you shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, some, some people are here that I won't mention their names so. And they like to show off their muscles. And they say, can you see this? You don't have to cover your mouth. Oh, I don't want to show you off. And they like to say, Dad, can you see this muscle? So when we love the Lord with all our strength, it doesn't mean that we show off our muscles and say, Lord, I love you. Praise God. Amen. All right. Praise God. Amen. You got it? That's better. That's better. All right. I like that better. Thank you. So when you love the Lord with all your might, it, uh, it shows that... You are loving him with something that is called muchness. Now, in physical exercise, the Bible says profits a little, right? It, so it doesn't mean that we cannot use our physical strength to love God. Now, it's part of your might or, or your all. But the interpretation of the word muchness is actually, a na as a noun, is, a, is non finite. It does not have a limit. It is not limited by, it, can, it is a word that can be used to represent and to mean so many things. Now, your muchness can also be defined as your glory. All right? It can be defined as your glory. So when we say your might, when we say the glory of the United States as a country, it does not mean how shiny United States is. Right? It means the might that comes with it. Now, if, um, if a police officer stops a car, right? Even without a gun and is addressing someone because it's in a unif because it's in a uniform, he has the might of the authority that sends him to back him up. Right? He can call for backup. Now someone who is not a police officer cannot do that. Because if things go bad, you can't call for backup. Praise God. When when uh, when someone a serviceman in the military of the United States is somewhere sent on an errand, he has the might of the United States government. That's the glory. That's the muchness. So when someone challenges that, they challenge the might, the glory, the weight, the muchness of the United States government. Are you with me? All right. So when you see a powerful man, you challenge him. So have you heard it? I will fight you with everything I have. They are telling you that they will fight you with their muchness. With how much I weigh. Do you know who I am? Some people are very, some people commonly say that. Do you know who I am? Nobody knows who you are. Praise God. But people like to show off who they are, their muchness, their might, their glory, their weight. And I'm not talking about how much you weigh on a scale, but how much might you have. Are you with me? Praise God. So it means your credits, you know, your credits. And sometimes it's how much money some people, how much money some people have in their bank accounts that gives them that euphoria, that feeling, the achievements, the awards you've won. You know, there are certain things that you can't, you, it, it, they, some people, once you start talking about those things, um, you just see, they just start, start smiling. You, they can pat themselves on the back. So they may pretend to be humble, but right in there, the head is swelling. They may not fit on the screen anymore. Praise God. Are you with me? So it's, that's your glory. That's your, your muchness. That's your mayod. That's your weight. It's your achievement, your accomplishment. All right? It, it's your why. Your reason for things. You know, I walked into somebody's office, I think about two months ago. It was a beautiful office. I had a meeting with this chief, ex with this chief executive officer. And as soon as I walked in there, it was a very nice office. And I said, wow, this is a really nice office. And she, I think she spent time to decorate that office. It looks really nice. And she takes pride in people commending how nice that office is. And I didn't know that. But she, you could see she was beaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now I realized that it wasn't the office that gives her the reason to do what she does. Because then I saw a picture of her children. I think she has three daughters on the wall. And I said, oh, wow, you have three children. She said, those are my why. That's why I come to work. That's why when I'm discouraged, I don't give up. When I think about them, that's why I act right. Your why. Your reason. That's your muchness. Are you getting me now? So now when Jesus now says, 
love the Lord with all your mehot, with all your muchness, with all your might, or your strength. Is that, it's talking about all those things. So, you know, I interview people, and I interview too. You know, wh- one of the common questions that we ask is, tell me about your strengths and weaknesses. When people want to talk about their weaknesses, they tell you one thing. <laughs> that, that reminds me a joke. Um, a r- true story. Um, I was prepping someone for an interview, this, uh, for, for an interview. And I said, one common question was, is, is, tell me about your strength and your weakness. And the person said, I have no weakness. I said, you are Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. The person is smiling now. Praise God. <laughs> now, so people talk about their weaknesses and they say, hmm, you know, a little bit of it. And then they wrap it up with something really sweet so you don't really see it. But then when you ask people to talk about their strength, they just go on and on about how they can move mountains and how they can up and they can fill valleys, how they can bring the sky down, how they can make it rain, how they can turn the sun, make the sun go dark, and people just go on and on and on and brag on themselves. And people talk about their strength. And if you could put yourself in that situation and think about what you would have said, God is saying, love me with that. Amen. So God demands that we love him with everything in our lives. And if you look carefully... If you look carefully, you remember I said this is an advanced course. If you look carefully, many of us have something that we hold back from God. Right? That's where it gets it starts getting tough. We have something that we hold back from God. So you can say, God, I can give you all this. All this, I'll give it. But that, mm-mm, don't touch that. That's not negotiable. God, please don't go there. You know, I am not actually, I'm just saying, have mercy. Don't go there. Do not ask me to give. And some of us can begin, can, can, can look inwards and can start see certain things that we know that, God, I don't want to joke with that. God, please don't ask me to give that up. Amen. Are you with me? So you, you, th- that thing, and what we do is we cover, we hide that thing, we bury it well, and we wrap it up with other things that we do for the Lord. God, so that it is not visible to everybody. Let's go to the book of Mark chapter 10 and Mark chapter 10 from verse 17. It's a ver- very popular parable or story that Jesus told in the Bible. So we, we hold something back that ho- that's almost becoming an idol in your heart. Now as he was going out on the road, there was one young man. He came running and he knelt before him respectfully and, sa- and said, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. Jesus is saying, why are you calling me good? Do you accept that I'm God? Do you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And then he said to Jesus, Jesus, I got all that. Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Liar. Praise God. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Now, he said, teacher, all these things I've kept, all all of this. Think about all the laws. 613, I've I've, I've done everything. There's nothing left. I got it all. So, the people are are careful to display their strength, the things that they do for the Lord. And they use it to bury, to hide, to protect that thing that they don't want the Lord to touch. So, Jesus looked at him and he loved him with love. And he said, no, the love of Jesus can be tough. He says, you you lack one thing. Now, you're telling me all these things. You know, I don't cheat. I don't murder. I don't commit adultery. I don't steal. I don't bear false witness. I don't defraud. I honor my father. I honor my mother. I do all these things. I pay my tithe. I, I fast three times. I'm a Pharisee. I'm better than that than the other guy. And, and, and was displaying all these things. But Jesus can see further than that. And more than that, beyond that, he said, you are lacking one thing. Though you are displaying your strength and your humility and saying, I, can, I just need it, eternal life. I have been perfect. I have been honorable. I've been just. I've been living right. But Jesus said, Mm-mm. there's one thing. One thing you lack. Go your way. Sell whatever you have. Give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, take up the cross, follow me. Hmm. If this were my house, this is where my this is where some of my kids would say pom pom. But he was sad at his word, and he went away sorrowful, for he had what 
great processions. Then, the G- then Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus, uh, and they were greatly astonished among themselves. And they said, who then can be saved? Because they are not saying everybody's rich. But they are saying everybody has something that they are hiding. Are you with me? Because it's not everybody that's rich. But they are asking the question, who then can be saved? So Jesus looked at them and said, with men, it is impossible. There is something called grace. But with God, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. I want you to tell someone, with God, all things are possible. So Jesus said, no, with God, all things are possible. There is something called grace. That's why I'm here. I'm the author of grace. So with men, it's impossible to please God, trying to say, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm not committing murder, adultery, I'm honoring my father and my mother, I don't cheat, I don't lie, I don't do any bad stuff. If that's not going to get you in. You're still lacking one thing. So they're saying, Lord, we know this thing. We know how it works. Everybody has something. So as everybody has something they don't want, they don't want you to touch. So if you're going to have to go for everybody's something, there's going to be trouble. It's going to be, who is going to be saved? Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. Let me tell your neighbor again, preach it. With God, all things are possible. So, Jesus challenged this man to love God and his neighbor with his muchness. Is that correct? From what we have said so far, that ties all ties together. With his muchness. And he told him, so go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, come follow me, take up your cross. But like him, many people give God so much. Does that sound familiar? We give God so much, and then we use that much to cover up what is hidden from God. He was quick to display how much is given. He was quick to display how much is, he was sacrificing. But then we hide it. So we try to hide certain untouchable areas from God. We just say, hmm, God, I know you can have all this. But let's not talk about that. That's just, that's just a no-go area. Why do we have to give that? We try to hide, hide certain untouchable areas, but God says, I need that too. I want it all. You know, we easily sing the song, I surrender all. But when God asks us to surrender all, how easy it is to surrender all. So thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your muchness, your mehod, your strength, your might. Even that one that you don't want to give. You know that Jacob had to give his mehod. He had to give his mehod. He, he had the, it was naturally talented to scheme. It was embedded in his name. He could scheme. He could... He could get away from Esau. He, could, he had divided his family into two different parties, and he stayed back. And before Jacob would get one party, second party, he would have escaped. The guy was strong, smart. He could scheme his brother. He could go to Laban, Laban's house and can get the younger before they try to get the older and can get a strategy and to get all Laban's wealth. I mean, the guy was good. But when he met with God at Peniel, what is your name? He had to give his muchness. And then he had to rely on God and not on his strength. So God always asks, love me with your muchness. We're going to look at a very interesting story. After that en- encounter, he couldn't run anymore. He was limping. He had to rely on God. All right? Let's look at a very interesting story from, from the father of faith, Abraham. Genesis chapter 22. I hope you're with me so far. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. <coughs> Excuse me. Genesis chapter 22. And I'll read from verse 1. So, God asked Abraham for his mehod. It came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. There comes the test. He says, then he said, now take your son, your only son. Now, do you think I, um, Isaac Ishmael wasn't born at this time? Was Isaac the only son? Now God was talking about his muchness, his mehod. 
take your only son. Now, I'm going to qualify it even further. Whom you love. That one that you've been hiding, that you've been praying, that nothing should touch this, this guy. Because, Lord, you know, seeing that I go childless, what should, I, what should you give me? Eliezer of Damascus shall be the heir of my house. I go childless. What are you going to do for me? Now, and then he tried to, to scheme, and then he got someone, and now God gave him the child of promise. And God saw that relationship, and he says, huh, yeah, we, we will see. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. He called him by name, said he's the one you love. Take him to the mount of, land of Moriah. And I'll find him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So, what did Abraham do? Seven um, verse 3. He took his muchness. Abraham arose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the, to the place which God had told him. And then God was watching him. Are you really ready to part with your muchness? God didn't tell him anything. Then he walked around on the third day. He had not changed his mind. Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey and I will go. And I and the lad will go yonder, worship and we'll come back to you. So God had to tell Abraham, give me your muchness. Your might, might. That thing which you love, give it to me. And, and when he did that, you can see, if you go to verse 15 of the same chapter, then the angel of the Lord called unto him. And it says, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and you have not withheld your son, your only son, bless him, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sands which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, sh all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. So, there is a muchness that you give to God that positions you for some strategic blessings. Set you up to receive that, those strategic blessings. So God will ask for much. And you wonder. There was a year. And when God spoke to us, my wife and I said, you know this, this thing that is coming from this place. Add it to this one and then add it to this one. And take everything as you're expecting it. And before you, before you pay taxes, everything as a whole, send it to the mission field. Boy, we thought it was a joke. Um, <laughs> we thought it was a joke. And then we started negotiating. It was a very clear instruction. And you just first think, like, get thee behind me, devil. And you thought, God, what about your word that says, give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God? At least the tax belongs to the government. So because that means we will have to cough up the tax ourselves if we've given all this to mission. And then we said, okay, maybe we can make a payment plan with, to, with God. Because this is just mehot. It's muchness. So we started negotiating that. And quickly, the word of the Lord came back again to us and said, you are delaying. There is no payment plan. As it comes, everything, mission field. It is something that hurts. But there is no way, there are, there are lengths that God will never take anybody who is not ready to give his muchness. That young man could not follow Jesus. He came asking for eternal life. But when the robber met the road and Jesus said, all you have, sell it. Give to the poor. Follow me. He didn't want eternal life anymore. How much are you willing to use to love God? That's the question. Can I say this? Will you still love me? Praise God. Will you still love me? All right, then I'll say it. Now, God demands that you love him with your muchness or your might. And if, if, you, if you love your muchness more than you love God, then your muchness has become an idol in your life. If you love your muchness, more than you love God, your muchness has become an idol in your life. Jesus says he must be the priority. He says, he who, Matthew chapter 10, and verse 37, he says, when one loves his father more than, more than me, he's not worthy of me. So it's easy. But you know, that's, that's a natural love. That's a, it, it's a given love whereby people love their parents. He who loves his father more than, more than me is not worthy of me, period. I want the best. I want to be the number one. And, he, and then he says, he thinks, and then he, he wants us to get it. 
And then he uses another analogy. How a parent, how parents love their children. If he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. All right? So he's saying, I want it all. I demand to be the priority. I must be in love. I must be the priority in your life. Now, we live in a culture um, that encourages us to align with greed and hold on to as much as possible. That whereby, you know, the more you can display in terms of your strength or muchness, right, the more, ch- the more you can carry. And no matter what it is, even if it is in, even if it is in accumulating debt, if your credit score is good, the higher it is, the, the better you are at uh, managing debt. Praise God. So, <laughs> so it is, he just wants you to accumulate as much as possible to show this is how much you are worth. And people compete to be number one here and number two there and number one here. And, and, and so it's a culture that says, keep all you can, can all you keep, sit on the can. Right? Just, just as, much as, as much as you can get. Amass the wealth. You know, that's your muchness. And when people talk about you, you just kind of talk about how you're a self-made man, how the power of your hand has built this and that. And people talk about how hard you have worked for it, how much you deserve this. You deserve nothing. Without him, you can do nothing. That's what Jesus says. Praise God. So that's, that's, that's what our culture encourages. That's what our culture reinforces. But it makes a difference, a huge difference, to be able to disengage from that orientation. The orientation whereby you, you amass as much as possible, you hold on to as much as possible, and you know that all you have is from God. That's where we're going. So you, you know that all you have is from God, and you can love him with everything. Give us First Chronicles chapter twenty nine, First Chronicles twenty nine fourteen. David was talking to the Lord here. First Chronicles twenty nine fourteen. David said, "Who am I, and who are my people, that we should be able to offer so willingly as this?" So, is David sees an opportunity to offer to the Lord as uh, sees the ch- chance to offer to the Lord as an opportunity to give to God as an opportunity to say, Lord, I am devoting my muchness to you. He said, because for all things come from you. Now, it's a very cardinal and crucial knowledge that every Christian must have. All things come from you. Not from my power, not from my might, not from what I have done. And of your own, we have given you. If we can imbibe this mentality or orientation, there's no muchness that's difficult to give to God. Are you with me? But it's difficult to think this and align it with our philosophy or way of life as Christians to know, like David said, that when I am called to give you anything, not necessarily money, we're going to get there, but when I'm called to give anything, it is a privilege to be able to offer willingly to the Lord. There are people God won't take from. The Lord had respect unto Abel and unto his offering. The Lord did not have respect unto Cain and his offering. Right? He says, David said, who am I? What a privilege to be able to offer for me to be able to give. For my people to be able to offer willingly unto the Lord. For we know that all things come from you. I remember when I was with the sheep. I remember when the prophet Samuel came to my house. And my father didn't remember me. Lined up all the sons I was not there. And they went through all of them. And they said, they had to say, is there someone else? And now you've made me this. It's a privilege. All things come from you and of your own we have given you. Can I hear an amen? amen? It's a great mentality. So that when God says, give me your muchness, you're able to give. First Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7, the scripture says, what makes you differ from another? And what is it that you have that you have not received So if you did receive it, the Bible says, why do you boast as if you had not received it? It's a great orientation and alignment. What is it that you have that you did not receive? And if you indeed received it, if you you indeed received it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Why do you think it's your muchness? Why do you beat your chest about it? So... The truth is, as Christians, God wants us to make God wants to make us channels of His resources, not a stinking reservoir. 
doesn't want the resources to come to you and just stay there like a stinking lake. Wants you to be a channel. I mean, if you remember the story of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, and when they came to Jesus and said, Jesus, tell my brother to divide the, the inheritance with me. And Jesus said to them in verse 15, said, look, the life of a man does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. So because we judge people's life by how much they have, how much they can keep. So Jesus is saying, no, as far as I'm concerned, the life of a man does not, it does not consist in the abundance of, a thing, of, of the things that he possesses. So it is not the possession that we amass that is muchness before God. So Luke chapter 12. And then he spoke a parable to them from verse 16. Verse 15 is where I quoted earlier. He spoke a parable unto them. Actually, let's go to verse 15. Um, and it says, take heed, be careful. It says, beware of covetousness. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Take heed, be careful, be, beware of covetousness. For the life of a man does not consist in 15, please. Yes. He said to them, take, be, beware of covetousness. For the life of for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. And now we can go to verse 16. Thank you. And then he spoke a parable uh, that the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. His ground yielded plentifully. He didn't do it. He didn't make it yield. The ground yielded. And then he thought within himself and said, what shall I do? Since I have no room to store my crops. All right? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and I will build, build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. In verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And verse 20, the scripture says, but God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then those, who do, then those, who, then whose will be those things which you have provided? And verse twenty-one, it says, "So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God." So there is a richness toward God. So is he who, who lay, lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So we can amass things, and then when God asks for it, what do we do with it? Now, next paragraph says, "How you expend your strength." your muchness, how you spend it, how you use it, is actually a reflection. Remember what we said at the beginning. It's a reflection and a means of expression of how you love God, of what you love and how you love. I'll say that again. How you expend your strength or your muchness is a reflection of, uh, and it's also a means of expression of what you love and how you love. So it will show the things you love will show in how you expend how you how you, how you expend your resources, and how you love will also show. Remember in John chapter twenty one verse fifteen, Jesus was asking Simon, Jesus asked Simon Peter, says, "Do you love me more than this?" After Peter went a fishing, Simon, do you love me more than this? And 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 you remember that woman Mary that came and anointed Jesus' feet, and was weeping and wiped his feet with her hair. So there's a connection between your heart and your strength. That's where I'm going. There is a connection between your heart. So if you love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, it will definitely reflect in your strength. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So your, your heart always follows your treasure. So there's always a connection. So that when people study you very carefully and they see where your, uh, how your heart is aligned, they can tell where your treasure is. <coughs> Excuse me. And what we keep back from God is very important from God. V sorry, very important to God. God is really interested in the things that we keep up from God. Now, we read the story of this woman in um, Luke chapter 21. Who, is a, who, was, who was a widow? <coughs> Jesus looked up and saw the rich people putting their gift in the treasury, Luke chapter 21. And then he saw a certain um, poor widow, and she put two mites. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, this poor widow, Luke 21, this, this poor widow has put in more than all. Then say more than the previous person, more than this, more than all. For all these, out of their abundance, have done what? 
put in offerings for God. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. So Jesus is looking at all. So in, as far as God is concerned, what he wants is your muchness, your all, your everything. Now, when, when you give your all or your everything, it rings a bell in heaven. There's a difference between your, your best, the best you have, and the best you have given. Huge difference. Sometimes, a lot of times, what we do is the best that we can give, the, the available best at the moment. And that's what we call our best. So God is looking and says, this woman is giving everything. So it rings a bell. She makes a mark because she's giving everything. So it's about proportion. Give me your muchness. I want it all, everything. You know the problem with Ananias and Sapphira? Do you know the problem? The problem was they lied that they gave it all when they didn't give it all. You know, Peter told them that when it was, when you had not sold it, it was yours. God didn't care about it. When you sold it, the money was yours. But now when you are giving it, why do you call what is not all your all? Why are you keeping something back from the Lord? That's the question. So, as we finish, there are several questions that are here. What proportion of your muchness would be a suitable expression of your love for God? So what proportion of your muchness is a suitable expression of your love for the Lord? That, that the Lord can say, yes, you are loving me with your mehod. And how much of your talent, how much of your talent or your treasure or your time does God deserve? How much of your talent how much of your treasure, how much of your time does God deserve? So your muchness consists of these things. Your talent, your treasure, your time. Will you bury your talent? you remember the parable of that, of the talents? Well, one was given five, one was given two, one was given one. According to their capacity, the person that was given one went and hid the talent. How much of that will be used to serve God? Does God deserve? And, and then the, the next question, will you use your manpower, your money, your materials to serve God? That's your might. That's your mehod. Will you use it? In Revelation chapter 4, we talk about mehod as your glory, your achievement. The Bible says in verse 9, Revelation chapter 4, that whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever, and ever, verse 9. Now, verse 10 says, uh, Revelation 4, 10. It says, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne. And they worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne. And then they say, you're worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. So that's the question. That's the question. Your glory, your crown, can you cast it? Can he ask you to put it aside so you can worship him, so you can serve him? It says, you shall serve the Lord your God, and the numbers, or number of your days it will fulfill. It will bless your bread and your water, and it will take sickness away from you. Can you serve him with your muchness? That's the question. It's a big question. How far will you go with God and not give up? Can you love him with all your strength? Can you say, even if he slays me? Yet I will trust him. That's the, your strength. Can you hold on to God no matter what? So you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and then with all your strength. Your strength is the means of expressing, of reflecting the love that you have for God in your heart, in your soul, and in your mind. Strength displays the depth of your love. If it cannot be displayed with your strength, with your might, with your achievement, with that thing that you don't think you can allow the Lord to touch, then the love in the heart is not enough. It's not there. The one in the soul that you think is there, the one in the mind, it, it must be reflected outwardly in your, with your strength. You shall love the Lord with all your might, with your mehod, with your muchness, with your 
everything with your very, very, very the greatest efforts that you have. That's what God is demanding. So will you please be on your feet this evening as we wrap this up? And speak to the Lord. And just say, Lord, I know what you are demanding. The disciples looked and said, Lord, who then shall be saved? Who then shall be saved? All right. If we look at the demands, who then shall be saved? Well, Jesus answered. I could imagine Jesus smiling and looking at them and said, hmm, with men, it is impossible. In Mark chapter 10, verse 27, with men, it is impossible, but not with God. Not with God. For with God, all things are possible. So there's a possibility to love God with all your strength. The scripture says it's the one who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So go ahead and just speak to the Lord and say, Lord, I just open it up to you. That what God wants is your willingness. If God says, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go here. God is looking for the willingness. Willingness to say, Lord, I love you with my muchness, with everything. And in those areas where I, I am still inadequate, not, I, I'm still insufficient. The scripture says, for we are not sufficient of ourselves so as to think anything of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God. So go ahead and just talk to the Lord this evening just, and just quietly ask the Lord to strengthen you and to help you. That you may love him with all your strength. That you may love him with all your might. That you may love him with your, all your mehot, with your muchness, with everything and give it, him, give it to him. That where he sends, you will go. When he calls, you will answer. When he leads, you will follow. Father, we just want to thank you. And you may be here and or online and be wondering, what, what are they talking about? And you have not even given your life to Christ. The Lord is calling on you. He wants your heart first. That's the first thing he wants. Give your heart to my son. Give me your heart. He wants your heart. And he's asking you to come home. He's asking you, my hands are open. I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hears my voice and open, he says it will come in. He's asking you to come, return, and hear his voice. And if you will just repent and say, Lord, I change. I turn from my ways, from depending on my abilities, from living in my sins. And I, acknowledge, and I acknowledge my sins and I ask for forgiveness and I believe that you've sent your son to pay the price for my sin. He died and he rose on the third day and I receive him into my heart as my Lord and my Savior. And I thank you because I'm saved and my name is written in the book of life. Father, we just give you praise, we give you glory. Lord, we receive strength, we receive the grace to love you with our muchness. The Bible says we can boldly come to the throne of grace. To find, to obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time and need. So we receive the grace. For with men, this may be impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. We receive the possibility of grace to be able to live a life that loves you wholly with all our hearts, with all our souls, our minds, and strength. For in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. And God's people said, amen. Can I hear a louder amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's just take a moment to pray for the man of God. Let's pray for strength. Let's pray that the Lord will continue to speak to him. And the grace to bring the word of God with simplicity and accuracy is released upon him in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that you continue to speak through your son in the name of Jesus. We will not lack your word in this house in the name of Jesus. Thank you, gracious Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord once again. All right, we thank God for that powerful teaching session. If you were blessed, put your hands together for the Lord. Amen and amen. God bless you, really good sir, in Jesus' name. I want to welcome you once again to GTIC Grace to Barnacle International Church here in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, our online family, thank you for being part of us tonight. Uh, just a quick remi uh, reminder that we meet here every Sunday, 9.15 a.m. and Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. Um, let's go ahead and 
give an offering. If you are paying it, uh, using a check, write it to uh, GTIC Memphis. And if it is Zell, GraceTabMemphis at gmail.com. And when we're doing that, we have very important announcement. And we all know that what is going to happen in this month of uh, April April 10 to 14 is going to be powerful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to encourage every one of us. Tell a friend. Tell a friend's friend. Use all your social media to announce this because it's going to be a powerful time in the presence of God. We're going to have Festival of Grace Conference 2024. You know, we say something that we are sponsored by grace in this house. So let's get more people to be part of what God is doing. So that is going to be on, actually, next week, Wednesday. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. So next week, Wednesday, God is going to be using his son, Apostle Sheikh Mubaje. We're going to be here on Wednesday. We're coming back on Friday. Friday is for women's only. So uh, invite your aunt, tell your wife, make sure that this place is uh, packed full on Friday. And on Saturday, we'll come back here with the teaching of the word abundant life. I don't know what has been taken or what is dead in your life. They're going to receive life in the name of Jesus. And when we come here on Friday, uh, we're going to be looking at daughters of the king. Daughters of the king. I cannot wait to be blessed. And I'm sure that you yeah, cannot wait to be blessed as well. And all this is going to be streamed live. So I want to encourage us, especially our online family, uh, to subscribe to all our social media handles. We have Facebook uh, at GTIC Memphis. Uh, we have Instagram at GTIC Memphis. And our YouTube channel, I want you to subscribe as well. And make sure you turn your notification on so that when we start program, then you will be reminded. Amen and amen. All right, let's bless our offering, our tithe, and our seed. Father, we thank you once again for tonight. Thank you for the grace to give heart of what you have given unto us willingly. What a privilege that we can be called sons and daughters of God that we can bring to you and you will accept us and you will accept our offering. Father, we do not take this for granted. We say thank you. Lord, we say thank you that we can boldly come to you and say this is how to, out of what you have given, we have brought this little to you. We have offered out of what you have given unto us. Lord, we say thank you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray that the blessing of them, that do your will will be upon us in the name of Jesus. You will open the windows of heaven over every one of us. We will not lack anything good. Lord, you will increase us in every area of life. We enjoy divine hands of God in the name of Jesus. Lord, in blessing, you will bless us. In increasing, you will increase us. In multiplying, you will multiply us in the name of Jesus. Father, when we need bread, you will provide bread. When we need seed to sow, you will provide seed. Because the Bible says you give bread to the eater and, and, and seed to the sower. Lord, all this you will give them unto us as needed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, gracious Father, for in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen and amen. The grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Grace.